Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Media Twits, episode 143. I'm Mark Glazer, executive editor of PBS Media Shift. Today we'll be talking about Charlie Hebdo in the wake of terrorist attacks on the magazine, which news organizations will be publishing cartoons and images depicting the Prophet Muhammad, and which have decided to self-censor and not run those cartoons, especially with a new issue that just came out this week um, with the Prophet Muhammad depicted on the cover. Various or news organizations have decided to run it and others haven't. We'll talk about kind of the moral decisions around that and also a video that came out showing a police officer shot um, and became a viral video. We'll talk about eyewitness video at the scene of these kinds of shootings and terrorist attacks and what should be run and what permissions should be around those types of images. Um, before we get into discussion, I want to give you a word from our sponsor. Running your own business requires focus, and so does parenting. MediaTwit's podcast sponsor, NextSpace, created a place where parents could give their best quality of attention to both, a co-working space and childcare space under one roof. Learn more at nextspace.us slash next kids and I am indeed in next space right now and my one-year-old son is next door in the next kids space so it's a great setup. Um, before we get into our discussion I want to introduce our panel. We've got uh, Dylan Byers joining us from Politico in New York. We've got Jenny Sargent joining us from southern Spain from the Eyewitness Media Hub. We have Kristen Hare joining us from Pointer Institute in Florida and Jefferson Yen, our producer from LA. So um, it's really been an interesting week for around media ethics and really just you know decisions being made at a lot of publications and news organizations, cable channels, whether to show some of these images that have been really controversial. Um, Kristen, I'm curious about your take on you know what is the calculus at a lot of these publications and how, you know, it seems like some of them are going back and forth. It's Why is this such a difficult decision? I think that what we've really seen in the last week and a day has been news, organiza news organizations at different stages of kind of uh, catching up digitally and those that are native digitally and how they make decisions. And so a lot of places like, um, you know, BuzzFeed, um, would run them instantly with no questions and other places like the Washington Post it took some time there was some discussion about what happened and then they explained their decision USA Today just recently um, ran one and explained why that they normally wouldn't run one of these but they felt like it was newsworthy so um, I think there's been a lot of watching the wheels turning and sometimes they move very quickly and sometimes they move very slowly yeah, and I mean, it was AP, CNN, New York Times have all said they're not going to run the new cover or any of these depictions. And Fox News, USA Today, CBS, and a lot of others have decided to run them. Um, what about this new cover um, that's just showing the Prophet Muhammad saying in French, all is forgiven with kind of a tear? It doesn't seem like it's necessarily offensive, but still a lot of publications are, don't want to do it. Why, why do you think that is, Kristen? I think this has been a tough decision for a lot of newsrooms to make because they want to be sensitive to readers and there are also safety concerns. Um, and I also think, again, back to what I said, I think there are, there are newsrooms that make decisions in a nimble way and, they're, and that's built into their process and who they are. And there are newsrooms that it takes a lot longer and, and things kind of run from the top down and that makes it really hard. I think there are also though, this isn't just a black and white discussion of do you run it or do you not, but um, I thought NPR's Mark Memmott made a really good point in defending why NPR wasn't running them and he said if we show you a couple of these covers, you're not going to see the content inside which is actually quite controversial and may get a sense of the story but not the full sense and so I, I think that's another argument that we've heard people make. That they're not seeing the entire picture just by seeing the covers. Yeah, that saying? one cover doesn't tell the whole story. Yeah. And Dylan, I know you've been covering this, uh, the free speech aspect of this and also just the question of whether, you know, even by the Quran that really this there's nothing in the Quran that says 
you know, there shouldn't be images of, of Muhammad. Um, what, what's your take on just kind of the research you've done and just some of these kind of, um, you know, excuses or whatever, you know, rules that some of these news organizations have put in, you know, do they really line up with reality? Well, I think after watching how some of the news organizations that have decided not to show um, the cover or any of the cartoons have handled it, uh, some news organizations have attributed that decision to safety, but most have safety of their staff, but most have attributed it to a sort of general policy that they don't uh, want to uh, show offensive images of the Prophet Muhammad, or that they just have a policy of, of not, uh, or, or that they, they don't want to offend the sensibilities of Muslim readers. And I think going back and looking at how several of these news organizations, most notably the New York Times, have handled other potentially offensive images, whether against Jews or blacks or what have you, is that I do think that there's sort of a um, an exception being made for Islam and an exception being made for the Prophet Muhammad specifically because of a belief that that any depiction of the Prophet is somehow offensive to Muslims, despite the fact that that is something that has developed over time within certain strains of Islam and is not something that is actually in the Quran. So I, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. I certainly don't think that there are any news organizations that have an obligation to show the image, but I do think that they uh, would do well to admit that they are making an exception here, uh, specifically because of Islam and because of the sort of political context uh, and the context of world events as they are. And tell us a little bit about what happened with CNN. They had this kind of town hall um, where, you know, they've decided not to show the image and um, you know, there was kind of an interesting discussion at the town hall. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So uh, Jeff Zucker, president of CNN, gives this global town hall, I mean, simulcast to every CNN bureau around the world, which, which is quite a wonderful thing to do, uh, and, and gets asked, obviously, about the policy on the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. Um, at one point, in, in an answer to a first question, he says, look, I'm not an expert on the Quran. So later on in the town hall, Christian Amanpour, the chief foreign correspondent, steps up and says, well, look, the Quran does not prohibit images of uh, the Prophet, and that's, in fact, something that has developed over time as sort of an interpretation of the Quran. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I think that uh, no one who was at that meeting seems to very much remember what, what Jeff Zucker's response to that was, nor has he responded to our request for a response uh, to that. But, but it does sort of highlight the sort of weird nature of this issue, right? Like, the, the, it's not that news organizations are really against publishing offensive content, period. It actually has to do with a very specific case and a sort of general understanding about the, the preferences and sensibilities of one religion. And do you, do you agree with what Kristen was saying about kind of the digital natives just jumping on these things and not having kind of the, the um, maybe waiting a little bit as some of the traditional organizations would do? I, yeah, I do. And I think that there, it, it's sort of changed now, right? Because the Washington Post has published an image and, and not every new digital news organization is publishing the images. But I think generally speaking, there's a line that sort of separates new and old media organizations. And I th new media organizations are sort of operating under the principle that, like, look, if it exists, it's probably on the Internet. So if there's a, a video of ISIS beheading an American journalist or a British journalist, that is going to be available to people on the Internet, whether we publish it or not. So who are we to say, this is what you don't get to see and this is what you do get to see? If it's on the Internet, it's fair game, which means I think that they're sort of they don't take so much time to mull these decisions over. Yeah. And Jenny, I'm curious about, the, you're in Europe, um, these kinds of arguments that are going on in the U.S., is that similar to what's going on in Europe? I mean, as far as which publications and outlets will run it, I know there was this thing on Sky News where uh, someone who came on the show pulled up a cover and they had to pull away and not show the cover. Um, is, is, this, is this mirrored? Is there a different take in, in Europe, or is it the same kind of things are playing out there? Exactly the same things are playing out, and I think um, I, you know, a lot of my colleagues said, God, I don't envy you going on this podcast and, and talking about such a sensitive issue. It's almost like nobody even wants to be part of the discussions, really, in case they say something you know, that, that perhaps you know, at this time, it's a very emotive time. 
you know, people want to be seen to be supporting, you know, obviously all of the victims of, of the, the sort of tragic events that took place last week. Um, there's this sort of groundswell of support which is perhaps leading people to make decisions and contribute. Certainly on social media there's lots of commentary where people we've seen have kind of deleted comments that they've originally made um, or ideas that, that they've had because of, of this rush to, to make quite a difficult decision on something that I think we perhaps all thought that we had, we had our own position on. Um, newsrooms obviously have their own set of editorial standards. Each, each one has a different set of standards which they would perhaps have assumed that they would comply with without question and then actually seeing you know, what the other organizations are doing and how it's playing out on social media, of course, impacts um, then their decision to, to run with the cover. So I think um, I was really interested to read Margaret Sullivan's piece in the New York Times about, um, you know, the fact that it's down to news value, uh, you know, the traditional um, reasoning to, to kind of run anything that may be considered sensitive or, or offensive. And I think um, I was interested that she came out and sort of openly spoke about that because I think... Um, yeah, I think perhaps actually to hear to hear people even within the same organization having conflicting views is, is fascinating. Yeah, and she really critiqued what was going on at the New York Times um, while the executive editor has basically said, no, you know, this is just not, we're not going to do this. And she's just said that was a wrong decision. It's, it should be published. Kristen, do you, do you believe that the, the part about news value, you know, if it has news value, it should be run no matter if it offends people? I think that's really up to each individual organization to make that decision, but the beautiful thing is, I think, for readers and listeners and viewers is that if they're not getting what they need, they can go someplace else. And so I would be interested to see, you know, in a couple weeks, the readership at places that have been on the front of this, and if that has this has gotten them, you know, new readers. But I do, I do think it's an individual decision, and um, I, I and I've seen some retweets from journalists at uh, at least at CNN when people telling them, you know, you should be running these, and they're retweeting those. You know, the decisions that our news organizations make aren't ours as individuals, and so the people at those news organizations have to live with that as well. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it is going to be curious to see what the repercussions of this are as far as who's running what, and, and because there's going to be more than this. This is just one, but it seems like something's going to happen for a lot longer time. I think this will be a kind of uh, a, a benchmark um, or a litmus test that we will come back to again and again. So when the New York Times or CNN runs something in particular, um, you know, we're going to look back on Dylan's great reporting and the other great reporting that media reporters have done and, and sh pulling up examples of things before. I think that this, this is something we're going to be talking about for a long time. No doubt. And um, let's talk a little bit about some of the video images that came out, this kind of raw footage that we see whenever there's kind of a breaking news. In this case, there was specifically one video of an eyewitness who was videotaping, you know, there was some, a gunman came by and ended up shooting a policeman. It was a pretty amazing video. You uploaded it to Facebook and then kind of thought, you know, that wasn't such a good idea and pulled it back. But by that time, it was too late and it had really spread around. It's been shown on TV. Um, Jenny, what's your take on just that entire episode and what it means when it comes to eyewitnesses and, and these types of events? I think it pretty much defines everything that we're exploring at Eyewitness Media Hub um, specifically for that reason because there is no set um, policy that we can share with newsrooms about how to handle eyewitness media because every situation is different. Um, the way that breaking news journalists now find information means that they can, you know, they will get that video as soon as it, it left Facebook and was put on YouTube. I mean, this is, we don't know the journey from uh, how it got from Facebook to YouTube, but this guy had about 2,500 Facebook friends, I think, so obviously someone there, you know, could have shared it just the once, and then, you know, we all know how quickly these things move on. So straight away, you've got the issue of consent. Uh, you know, once the guy's taken it down, how do newsrooms gain consent to use the video in the first place? Um, the content of the video itself is a fascinating topic, because actually how much of, of that raw footage were newsrooms prepared to run? Um, again, Kristen's point about precedent here is really interesting because we've seen probably since the Boston Marathon bombings, um, 
just how, you know, with so much graphic imagery that was being shared, it's almost like the newsrooms were being forced to loosen their boundaries and, um, and perhaps have that assumption that, well, it's been seen already, but actually for some newsrooms their policy will still restrict them and, and some of them either edited heavily the, the video and ran with it, but still without consent, bear in mind. Uh, some of them pixelated parts of the video uh, and ran it still without consent. Um, you know, how quickly they ran it is a different story. There's a very interesting point about broadcast versus online, because obviously there are wider restrictions, or that there are much tighter restrictions, sorry, on anything that's broadcast uh, than there is about footage that, that remains online. So some news organizations were being very careful about what they broadcast as part of their coverage, but then their journalists were tweeting the video in full, or they were putting it up in full on their online news site. So, it's it's a really fascinating subject. Most definitely. And um, Dylan, do you think that social media, these kinds of images and graphic images and videos, that social media is kind of pushing news organizations to run more of them? Yeah, I mean, I think if there's one sort of theme that's like emerged from our conversation so far, it's that the again, the, in, the, the information is sort of there and will get out there. And at the end of the day, there's really robust debate about whether or not in organizations like the Times or CNN publishes pictures or cartoons or videos or what have you. Almost doesn't matter because any user who wants to find those can find them. I guess the, the sort of, uh, and, and, and I do think too that, that uh, the more you have digital media sites and social media pushing this content out there, the harder it is for these traditional news organizations to justify not publishing it because they just almost look archaic, uh, uh, it, it, like Luddites in their decision to not address that material head on. The other thing I'll just quickly say is if, if the internet has sort of created this landscape where everyone is a content provider and so the content will always get in, out there, the role of uh, traditional me media organizations like the Times, like CNN, is that they are context providers. And I don't mean that in a sort of like Vox, Wonk, Blog, Explainer way. I mean that they actually uh, are a destination for people who want all of the information that's out there to be sort of collected and, and, and curated and, and put in its proper order, right? So this matters, this is news, this is not news. And I think that if you were to go back 150 or 200 years from now and sort of turn over the pages of the New York Times and, or, or go through the digital archive, you would be really disappointed to see that in the wake of an attack on another newspaper or magazine, um, because they had published certain images, that the Times was then covering that and not providing its readers with an example of what the images were, which are really at the center of the story. So the more that social media can sort of push the New York Times over the edge or CNN over the edge, I think the better. Kristen, what's your take on that as far as, you know, this really pushing publications to change the way they do things? I mean, do you think, you talked about the context and having more than just the cover and, and news organizations do that. I mean, part of it is verification of some of these images. Um, I mean, if you're just on social media, you don't really know what to believe or what, what's out there, who's put this up. I mean, maybe this is really what the traditional organization is, what the, the role that they still have to play is not only contact, verification, tell us the, the whole story, not just here's an image that's going to, you know, that's going to offend you. Yeah, I totally agree with Dylan. I mean, I want, I know what happened. I want to know as a reader why, and I want to hear from voices that aren't in my networks and that aren't uh, voices I'm regularly hearing from. So there was a really good example of this, of course, from an explainer site, Vox, this morning, uh, or it may have been yesterday, they had um, a piece about a new site devoted to explaining Charlie Hebdo cartoons to English speakers. And um, I found it fascinating because I've spent a lot of time on Google Translate and there's a lot of, of cultural meaning that I'm missing out on. So having that layer of context uh, is, is totally valuable. And, and I do think that there have been some U.S. News, news organizations that have done a good job, you know, with this. But the truth is that most of these major organizations are, have communities that could speak to this. And I would love to hear from more people in those communities who could, you know, give us perspective about what's going on. That's true. 
Um, and Jenny, you, um, one of the things in the Eyewitness Media Hub brought up around um, the kind of eyewitness stuff that's out there is that there's some geolocation. I think it's on Instagram pictures where you could literally track down. I mean, in a way, maybe that helps you verify that, hey, this did come from someone in that location, but also you could track down the person. <laughs> and, like, there's a little bit of privacy involved in, you know, what you're putting up online, right? Absolutely. I mean, we try and be sensitive to both sides um, of the, the event because, obviously, we completely sympathize with news Dreams, the chaos and the, the sort of frantic nature that they're under to try and ensure that they're reporting the story accurately. Um, we actually, you know, create uh, verification training materials, and, and in those materials, we suggest that they go straight to Instagram and look at the uh, geolocation feature so they can, you know, kind of cross reference and, and double check quickly. On the flip side of that, uh, we would also advise eyewitnesses to turn their location feature off. <laughs> because of the privacy element, the fact that uh, there is a safety issue. Um, I feel a bit clumsy and, and dramatic saying that, that there would be fear of reprisal, but as those uh, attacks were playing out on, on the, the sort of first day in Paris, you know, the gunman was still at large. We didn't know uh, what was happening. And I made a point in the blog post of, of sort of trying to put ourselves in the shoes of those eyewitnesses. The guy who posted the, the sort of famous video spoke about being on his own in his flat and feeling panicked and, and really he posted it to, to Facebook because he wanted to talk to somebody because he felt scared. Um, and I think we have to sort of take a moment to think about, yes obviously there's a, there's, that video played a major part in how the story was, was, was reported and, and it gave us all a real sense of how terrifying it was. But at that time, the moment that, that the news organization started running it and he turned his television on and saw that it was his video that was being played and he was responsible for sharing that moment with the world, um, I think we do have to be a little more careful uh, about taking that moment to think about these, these people. You know, they are, they are people uh, and they're not seasoned reporters. They're not used to experiencing these kind of events. They won't necessarily have thought about the repercussions either for the safety of themselves or the people that feature in the videos and photographs that they've captured, which is an entirely different subject. You know, we're trying to kind of educate, in a way, not not being preachy or finger waggy, if that's a word. Uh, at all. Should be. Um, <laughs> it is now. Um, but you know, really, just just to kind of emphasise that there are there's a thought process that needs to happen. And one another point I made in the blog post was that actually the fact that nobody got in touch with him, to, or very few people got in touch with him to seek permission meant that they were actually ignoring some of the basic verification steps that any newsroom should be considering anyway, which is asking the eyewitness when they first see the video, were you there? Did you take the footage? You know, are you safe? All of, all of the basic questions that, that really should be considered that kind of went out the window during this event. But equally, we understand why it happened. And so you're trying with your media hub, you're trying to both kind of uh, educate eyewitnesses and also news organizations as well? Yeah, well, and brands, which is an entirely different issue because the way brands now use um, what we used to call user-generated content, which is the same kind of thing as Eyewitness Media, we've just tried to define it a little more clearly. But, um, you know, with all of this footage being uploaded all the time, um, we have to think of the intention of the user when they first upload their content. Very often they honestly think they're just talking to their friends and family. Before they know it, they find themselves on a on an advert. I won't name a brand, but you know, <laughs> um, quite right. a few. They call them war rooms now, you know, instead of newsrooms where these brands are actively finding content posted because it because you know, as Dylan said, it's 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 out there, it's viral, it's got a value. Um, and so what we're really trying to to say is kind of create some policies and guidelines for everybody involved, from the eyewitnesses themselves through to the people who we, who are publishing it, because there is a legal aspect. There is a very serious copyright issue to consider. It's very boring. Uh, we had a great, in fact the blog post is going up later today I think, we had a great uh, conversation with a media lawyer in the UK who clarified for us that actually using that video despite the fact it was taken down from Facebook, um, despite the fact that they hadn't sought permission, it falls under the fair use defence um, in terms of reporting a news event. So the newsrooms who did choose to run it were absolutely entitled to do so. However, that fair use defense is only applicable during the, the time that the event is happening. So 72 hours on, all of those news sites that have that video really should take that down from a copyright perspective. So I won't bore you with the legalities, but it's another consideration as we talk about eyewitness content. Yeah. 
It's, it's really interesting. And I wonder now what the future of Charlie Hebdo is with this new issue printing 3 million copies that I guess all sold out and now they're going for 5 million copies. Um, I'm curious what the future of this um, publication is going to be. I mean, it seems like the 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 cartoonist left might be you know might be in serious you know, could be in serious harm's way, and also at the same time they're becoming this global phenomenon that so many people want to follow. Dylan, what's your take on kind of what will happen next, just for this publication and satire in general? Sure. Well, I I have to imagine that it only gets stronger, right? I mean, I think that that immediately the folks at Charlie Hebdo um, committed to doubling down and to not shying away. I mean, and they certainly had a much more courageous response than, say, the executives at Sony Pictures in the wake of the North Korea hack. Um, the, 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 I think that cartoonists occupy a very awesome space in, in like contemporary media because they, they, they're, they're fun and they're commentators and they get to be they get to be bold in a way that most of us who are doing reporting or commentary or criticism do not. Um, and I think that this was a very unique uh, opportunity for them to sort of come together and stand together and a lot of them did and a lot responded by uh, publishing uh, cartoons that at the very least were sympathetic with Charlie Hebdo and, and at most actually were pictures of the Prophet Muhammad or, or said, no, we're not backing down and, and the pencil will erase the gun and this, that, and the other thing. So I actually think this is uh, the silver lining to the very, very dark cloud is that is that satire and especially um, illustrated satire is actually going to enjoy a really great, robust moment where they stand in the face of, of of what just happened. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate the discussion. I think it was really good. Um, I want to thank our entire panel, Dylan Byers, media reporter at Politico, Jenny Sargent from Eyewitness Media Hub, Kristen Hare from Pointer Institute, and Jefferson Yen, our producer, and also our sponsor, Next Space and Next Kids. You can learn more about their co-working and child space at nextspace.us slash nextkids and PBS and the Knight Foundation for making this podcast possible. You can catch us every week at PBS Media Shift at pbs.org slash media shift. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>